this video we're going to go ahead and get more practice on solving radical or rational exponent uh, equations. And in fact, I really dislike how I labeled that. It should be rational exponent equations, not just rational equations. Because a rational equation is actually something completely different. This is part two of solving equations involving rational exponents or radicals. This time around we're going to solve equations of the form junk to the m over n is equal to junk. In other words, uh, we change the exponent here from being 1 over n to m over n. There's several prerequisites. You have to know everything about exponents. You have to know all the laws of exponents. You have to know about integer exponents, including negative exponents and zero exponents. You have to know about fractional exponents, or in other words, rational exponents. You have to be able to simplify radicals or know what a radical is, be able to solve equations, and also solve rational exponent equations with some base to the 1 over nth power. So that's quite a few prerequisites, but that's how it goes when you get deeper and deeper into a topic. You need all the information that that topic had prior to be able to work with the topic that you're currently on. So we'll just dive right into it. Let's go ahead and solve a bunch of equations here involving exponents of the form m over n. So fractional exponents. And we're going to round answers to the nearest thousandth if we have to. If we don't have to, uh, we'll get exact answers. Try to do everything without a calculator when possible. So here I have uh, an equation that involves only one unknown. So remember if I have only one unknown or one version of my unknown, I list out what happened to that unknown. So in other words, what happened to x here. And the first thing, follow the order of operations, the first thing that happened to x was that it got raised to two-thirds power. So I'll raise it to two-thirds. And then the second thing that happened to x, remember follow the order of operations again, so after doing exponents you look for any uh, multiplication, division, addition, or subtraction, and we have a subtraction by one. So I'm going to undo those things in reverse order. In other words, it's like tying a knot. The last thing that the person tied was they, or the last thing they did to x here is they tied it up with a negative 1 or a subtraction by 1. So I'm going to undo that subtraction and the inverse operation to subtraction is addition. So I'm going to add 1. And then the inverse operation to raising something to the 2 thirds power is raising it to the inverse of 2 thirds or in other words the 3 halves power. That's what I'm going to do. Those are my inverse operations there. So let's go ahead and see what happens when I add 1 to both sides, following my recipe here. And you'll see that that gives me x to the 2 thirds is equal to 16. And now my next clue to myself is to raise both sides to the 3 halves power. So raise the left hand side to the 3 halves and the right hand side to the 3 halves power. And when I do that, well, two th x to the 2 thirds being raised to the 3 halves, remember, powers to powers multiply, so the 3's will cancel, the 2's will cancel, this will become x to the first. And that's 16 to the, two, to the 3 halves power, or in other words, the square root of 16 being raised to the third power. And of course, we know the square root of 16 is going to be 4. And 4 to the third will be 64. Now at some point, we raise both sides to the third power, um, which means that because we raise both sides to a power, we should probably check our answer. In reality, you only have to check your answer if you raise both sides to an even power at some point. Uh, but we didn't here. We we raised both sides to an odd power. That's the third power right there that we raised both sides to. And then we took the square root of both sides as well. But uh, you could check your answer here if you want. The, you'll plug it in to x there. So we have 64 to the 2 thirds minus 1. But 64 to the 2 thirds, that's the third root of 64, which is 4. And 4 squared is 16. 16 minus 1 is 15. That checks out. 
And this problem uh, is a very interesting problem, actually, because it's not typical of the style of problem you would see, but I like this problem nonetheless. When you're a student, you don't recognize that this is not typical, but when you're an instructor, you recognize this is somewhat not typical. Usually that power would be on the outside of the parentheses. All right, so I see I have one version of my variable, so I'm going to go ahead and list out what happened to my variable. And I'll start using the order of operations. You hop inside these parentheses here. And you look at your variable and you say, okay, now, here's my variable x. What's the first thing that happened to it? Ah, I got raised to the 5 third power. Then after x got raised to the 5 thirds power, it actually got multiplied. You, a lot of people don't re realize this, but it got multiplied by a negative 1. Multiplied by a negative 1. And then after it got multiplied by a negative 1, they added 5.2 to it. So now they did x to the 5 thirds, they threw a negative on it, they added 5.2 to it. That whole picture then, once they're done with that, they multiplied it by 2. So now we have to undo all of that work that they did to hide the value of x from us, whoever they is. First thing I'm going to do is divide by 2. You see, the last thing that they did was multiply by 2, so I'll undo that multiplication with division. The next thing I'll do is undo their addition of 5.2 with a subtraction of 5.2. The next thing I'm going to do is undo their multiplication of a negative 1 by a division of negative 1, which is the same thing, by the way, as multiplying by negative 1. And finally, I'll undo their power. They raised to the 5 thirds. I am going to raise to the 3 fifths. That will unlock that power. So let's go ahead and start this. First thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by 2. So here we are, divide this side by 2 and this side by 2. And you'll see 2 over 2, that turns into 1. So I have this beautiful... 5.2 minus x to the 5 thirds equals 0.7. Now, something I should note here, there's nothing multiplying, well, there's, there's a 1 multiplying this parenthesis, but there's no reason to write that parenthesis, so I'm just going to rewrite this without the parenthesis. Now, let's see, the next thing I tell myself to do is subtract... 5.2 from both sides. The left hand side is pretty easy. Left hand side, 5.2 will cancel. And I'll have a negative x to the 5 thirds. The right hand side becomes a negative 4.5. That's my guess here. Let me just double check. Yeah, that looks about right. And now my next instruction is divide both sides by a negative 1. So I'll go ahead and write that in. Divide by a negative 1 divide by a negative 1. The negatives on the left-hand side cancel nice. And we get that x to the 5 thirds is equal to 4.5. At this point, I'm going to raise both sides. This is my last instruction to myself. Raise both sides to the 3 fifths power. 3 fifths here. And again, the right-hand side, 3 fifths didn't leave enough room, but whatever. Remember, powers to powers multiply, so 3 fifths times 5 thirds, they cancel and become 1. That's how we design that. So that'll give me a single x is equal to 4.5 to the 3 fifths power. And this, I'm going to have to reach for a calculator here. And as I did before, I've been using the TI quite a bit in my lecture, so I'll go ahead and use Wolfram Alpha here. So let's do this 4.5 raised to the, start a parenthesis for the exponent, 3 fifths power. Hit enter. And, well, even before I hit enter, it gave me the answer. And I'm going to round this, like I told myself, to the nearest hundredth, or maybe I said thousandth. I think I said thousandth. So this would be 2.466. Let me write that in here. This is roughly equal to 2.466. And we're done with this example. Kind of an odd-looking example, but we got through it. 
And you can always check your work here because you did happen to raise both sides to a power at some point. In fact, at some point we raised both sides to the third power. And then we took the fifth root of both sides. That's what the three-fifths power is. So we technically raised both sides to the third power. But as I mentioned in the past, you really sh don't have to check your solutions if you raise both sides of an equation to an odd power. It's when you raise both sides of an equation to an even power is when you have to actually check your solutions. All right, we have a last final example in this example set here. Um, and I notice again, I only have one version of my variable, so that's good luck for us. We just ask ourselves, what happened? What happened to x? And that's um, always a good first question. So let's see, somebody came along and said they took x and they subtracted 3 from it. They then raised that x minus 3 to the 5 halves power. And then after they did that, they multiplied it by 2. So I'm going to undo all of that stuff, starting with the last thing that they did. Again, like I'm untying a shoe. I will divide by 2 instead of multiply by 2. I will undo their power of 5 halves with a power of 2 fifths. The reciprocal power will always undo the original power. And finally, they subtracted by 3. I'm going to add 3. Let's go through and do this. I'm going to divide both sides by 2. And you see on the left hand side, 2 over 2 turns into 1. So this is just 1 times the quantity x minus 3 to the 5 halves power. On the right hand side, 64 over 2, that's just 32. The next step, let's see, we're done here. Next step, we're going to raise both sides to the 2 fifths power. Raise the left hand side to the 2 fifths. Notice that I'm squaring the left hand side here. That may present a problem because it's an even power, so something you have to watch out for. Powers to powers cancel, so this is just going to turn into an x minus 3 on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, that's the fifth root of 32. I'll even write it in here. The fifth root of 32 being raised to the second power. One thing I'm going to do here, uh, I forgot to write in my implication signs. One thing I'm going to do is mention since it's only a 1 times x minus 3, I can remove the parentheses there and just write x minus 3. And then the fifth root of 32 is 2. So this is going to be x minus 3 is equal to 4. And then I tell myself to add 3 to both sides. And so I get that x is equal to 7. Now I'm going to have to check my answer. It's just a reality of the situation as I want to check my answer here because it could be the fact that maybe, maybe it wasn't meant to be. So here we go. Uh, the original uh, equation was 2 times the quantity of x, which we're saying is 7, minus 3 raised to the 5 halves power. And it's supposed to equal 64. Let's see if it does. Following the order of operations, 7 minus 3 is 4. Uh, that 2 in the denominator of the exponent tells me it's a square root, so square root of 4 is just 2. 2 to the 5th is 32, and 2 times 32 is 64, so it does check out. Again, just being very meticulous and checking all my work. Well, not all of my work, obviously. I haven't up to this point, but uh, it's always a good idea to try. Let's go ahead and do one application here. And this is from the textbook by the Yoshiwaras, Bruce and Catherine Yoshiwara, uh, Modeling Graphs and Functions, 3rd edition. Uh, during a flu epidemic in a small town, health officials estimate that the number of people infected T days after the first case was discovered is given by I of T is equal to 50 times T to the 3 fifths power. I obviously stands for the number of infected. So that's the number of infected at T days after the first case was discovered. So let's complete this table of values. We're going to substitute in uh, these values of T here. So we want to know what I of 5 is. Well, that's 50 
times 5 to the 3 fifths power. And one thing to note here is if you can't take the fifth root of that number, then you need a calculator. In fact, all of these I can't take the fifth root of, so I'm going to need a calculator for each of these. So let's go ahead and just bring up a, a calculator here, and uh, I'll, I'll again use Wolfram Alpha. I already typed it in, and notice how it works. It's 50 asterisk is the multiply symbol in computer language. Uh, 5 to the 3 fifths power, and I see that that's going to be 131.3. I'll go ahead and round these to the nearest tenth here. So 131.3, I'll write that in here. And now I'm going to exchange out the 5 for 10. And that's 199.1, rounded to the nearest tenth. And now I'm going to let t equal 15. So in other words, I'm going to change that 10 to a 15. It's 253.9. And finally, exchange out that 15 for a 20. It's 301.7. Now something you should note here, this is actually a number of people, and since you can't have three-tenths of a person, these really should be rounded down to 131, 199, 253, and 301, because you can't have seven-tenths or even nine-tenths of a person. Technically, that's really how I would probably require my students to do it. How long will it be before 300 people are ill? So this is asking us, when is the output, this stuff right here, when is that 300? In other words, we want to know when is 300 equal to 50 times t to the 3 fifths power. Now I've done enough of this, you know, writing down and uh, it, the inverse moves and stuff like that. So I'm just going to divide, I'm going to immediately go into it and divide both sides by 50. And I will get, in this case, that 6 is equal to t to the 3 fifths power. I'll raise both sides, this I will illustrate, I'll raise both sides to 5 thirds power because that undoes a 3 fifths, the reciprocal power undoes. So I get that t, which is the number of days since the very first person was infected, is equal to 6 to the 5 thirds power. Now I don't know the third root of 6, which means that I am going to likely have to uh, use a calculator. So let's let's go ahead and go back to Wolfram Alpha here. Six to the five thirds power. Let me go ahead and erase what I have here. Six caret is the raised to parentheses five thirds. Always pay attention to the parentheses. That's 19.8. It's a little over 19 days. T is roughly equal to 19.8, but in reality. How long will it, be, will it be before? We'll say 19 days. 19, 19 days will have passed prior to 300 people becoming ill. On the 20th day, definitely more than 300 people are ill. And then this last little bit, graph the function and verify your answer to part B on your graph. Now this right here definitely requires a graphing calculator uh, or perhaps you graphing by hand. But when you see something like this, all I know for base functions, and all I can really graph for base functions, are things like um, x or x squares or x cubes or square roots of x or cubed roots of x or absolute values of x or 1 over x's or 1 over x squareds. Okay, I can graph anything that says y equals any of those or any kind of manipulations of those, but I don't have anything where I can graph x to the three-fifths power. It's a little more challenging. So that type of thing you'll need a graphing calculator for. So let me just show you how you can do that using a graphing calculator. Here we are. Um, I'm going to go ahead and plot y equals 50. On your graphing calculator, it, t is not going to be the variable. It's going to be x raised to the parenthesis three-fifths power. 
this is generally how it's done. Now you could use other graphing utilities. It doesn't have to be a graphing calculator. I even think that Wolfram Alpha will actually work as well. But when you graph something like this, you generally have to choose a nice window. So I'm going to click on window here. And remember, our X is actually our time, the number of days that this pandemic's been going on, or epidemic, I guess. So we're not going to have a negative number of days. I'm just going to start at day zero and go on to day, let's see. Um, well, I know the answer to part B is 19. So let me go up to 25, day 25. And then X scale, that just means how do you want to scale the X axis? By one is fine. I'm not going to have a negative number of people being sick, so I'll just start the number of people at zero. And uh, I see that the number of people, as time goes on, goes beyond 300. So I, maybe I'll go to 400 here. There's no real reason for your, to change your Y scale, but if you really want to do it, you can change your Y scale to like 50 or something like that. And hit graph. It's an interesting graph, actually. It's it's uh, ever increasing, it looks like. And it says graph the function and verify your answer to part B on your graph. This is how you can do that. Uh, one thing you can do is hit the trace button and you notice there's a little blinking cursor on there. You can scoot that over using the left and right arrows. And you see like day 9.8, uh, we have 197 people sick. So let's see, around day 10, there's a roughly 200 people. And look, according to our table, that's about right. We want to know when we have 300 people sick, so you can keep going to the right. These are the number of people sick, the Y values. So keep going to the right until you're about at 300. And you'll see it's about 19 days. That kind of makes sense. If you really want to be accurate here, you can recall that Really, the number of days was 19.8115, blah, blah, blah. So you can actually type in that number into your calculator. Type in 19 point, you don't have to go through all this, but maybe 811563. That's fine. And hit enter. And you'll see 300 people are sick on that, on that, at that very moment. It's a pretty neat idea. There's another way you could do this, though, if you really want to get kind of creative you can actually graph the line 300. In other words, it'll just be a horizontal line at a height of 300. And so this tells me this is when 300 people are sick, where these two lines, where the line and the curve cross. And what you can do is you can calculate where they cross using the calculate feature of your graphing calculator. That's accessed via the second button and then accessing the trace submenu which if you just hit the trace button you see calculate all that stuff is right there and one of the options is intersect so you can find out where these two intersect hit enter to select it it'll say hey which one is your first curve well that curve looks like the first curve I'm interested in so I'll hit enter it says is this your second curve that you're interested in I say yes and I hit enter it says hey I'd like you to take a guess as to where they cross so I'll get as close to the crossing point as possible it doesn't have to actually be on it once you feel comfortably close, you just hit enter, and it'll start calculating and say, oh, okay, 19.811563. That's the number of days that have passed when there are 300 people sick. Very interesting and kind of neat thing to do. Okay? So that's a good use of the graphing calculator in a problem like this.